Good afternoon, Tansay and Ian. Welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. Our In Focus segment this afternoon is a tough conversation, but one that needs to be talked about and the issues brought forward. Today, we're putting racism in the healthcare system in focus, and we want you to join in on our conversation. You can tweet us at APTN In Focus, or you can email us at infocus at APTN. Well, there's no sense in wasting any time. Let's get today's show started. A study by the University of Alberta and the First Nations Information Governance Centre last year shows unequal treatment in Alberta emergency rooms. As APTN's Chris Stewart reports, some people in high places are starting to notice. When someone gets hurt badly enough, they normally go to the nearest emergency room. A health worker will assess the damage and assign a triage score from 1 to 5. 5 being non-urgent, 1 being the most serious. The University of Alberta studied 11 million visits to Alberta emergency rooms between 2012 and 2017. The result? First Nations people are triaged at a less important level, meaning longer wait times or the patient just leaves before getting treatment. Dr. Patrick McLean of the University of Alberta in Edmonton led the study. For three of the five diagnoses we looked at, that's long bone fractures, acute upper respiratory infections, and anxiety disorder, we also saw that First Nations had lower odds of receiving these higher acuity triage scores. Broke your arm or leg? You are 18% less likely to have a higher triage score than a non-First Nation patient. 10% less likely for respiratory infections. And anxiety disorders, the number jumps to 33%. Overall, First Nations people have a 7% less likelihood of a higher priority triage. Leah Bill is the executive director of the First Nations Information Center, a registered nurse from Pelican Lake First Nation in Saskatchewan. She co-led the study talking to people and elders, many who said they were not treated very well. There was many stories shared with regards to uh, racism, for example, uh, uh, derogatory things being said about them uh, by healthcare providers, and, and then them leaving and not getting the care that they needed. She says health providers need to stop stereotyping people. There is a presumption that uh, when Indigenous people or First Nations people present to the emergency that they're drug seeking as opposed to coming with a serious uh, um, condition. Uh, my, my viewpoint on that is, is it doesn't matter whether or not you, you have uh, an addiction issue. Uh, the first and foremost thing when, when you present at the emergency department, uh, you should be assessed and triaged for a physical condition. Bill says that Alberta Health appears to be listening. We have provided them with recommendations. The good thing is that they are listening to us. And, and I believe that they are seriously looking at uh, ways and mechanisms to bring about change. Uh, they do support our research uh, completely. But what we'd ask of the providers is that they really strive to see the patient before them as a unique individual. And we hope that these study findings are going to drive that kind of positive change and help improve the healthcare system. And just a bit of an update on that story. Eight Indigenous communities and organizations from across Alberta will be partnered with emergency departments to help a four-year project with the University of Alberta. All right, our, our first guest this afternoon is a Dr. Dr. Barry Lavallee of the Kiwetnuk Inanu Minayewin Inc. KIM or KIM was established to work towards a new health system that will better respond to the needs of Northern First Nations people in Manitoba. They support health and wellness services with a focus on equitable care, addressing racism in the healthcare system and other healthcare needs.
Dr. Lavalley, thank you so much for joining us here in studio. It's, it's always great to have in studio guests. Now, our episode today isn't uh, the, the greatest of topics, but it's a very important one, and that's racism in, in the healthcare system and the problems Indigenous people face mm -hmm. within the healthcare system. So, my first question for you is just sort of an overall question, and, and what are you seeing within the healthcare system when it relates to Indigenous people? Well, it, you know, I mean, that's a good question. Um, you have to imagine that the evolution of the response to that question really is about 20 years experience. So if you asked me the same question 20 years ago when I was you know, 10 years into practicing medicine, I'd say I wouldn't be able to see what was in front of me. It's a really important phrase I'm giving you, I wouldn't be able to see what's in front of me. Because that question, uh, the response to that question is does the government and do non-Indigenous people see and feel what we do when we experience racism? So. You know, when I was a medical student um, in 1986 um, or 87, I, w I admitted a, an Indigenous man who had an upper GI bleed to a ward, um, and he was he was quite ill. And I was not; I was a junior doctor. I didn't know how to resuscitate. He died under my care, um, and I was really upset um, because he should have actually been in ICU but I was a junior, junior medical student. Right. Um, and I called several times to my seniors, and the next morning, uh, one of my senior people just giggled and said, that can happen. But he was a 40-something-year-old uh, Indigenous man, so that was my first abrupt material consequence of racism that I saw. And I got a complaint from my ward uh, teachers that I was too sensitive about racism, but a man had died. So the question, uh, the answer to your response is, um, we examine racism uh, as a CEO, I'm a CEO for Kuwait Nook and Newman Oyawen mm -hmm. uh, Inc. Um, and we examine details of cases now. So we're much more sophisticated in seeing what other people don't see. And that's really the, the problem with addressing race, indigenous specific racism in healthcare. Well, as you just mentioned, with, with KIM, you're the CEO of that, mm -hmm. and you work primarily with, with the northern sort yes. of region, yes. right? So, um, what kinds of challenges specifically are faced by those in those northern and, and remote communities? Sure. I, I mean, the structure of the healthcare system in community, as well as the structures uh, within northern Manitoba, are deficient, full stop, okay? Um, and one wonders in a population in northern Manitoba where 70% of the people indeed identify as indigenous, be First Nations or Métis, very few uh, Inuit in that area. But why is it that there's a deficit of good technology, whereas in the south, where's it primarily non-indigenous and, and uh, settler descendants, do we have more resources? So the function of racism then is not always face-to-face uh, you know, uh, discrimination and lack of care, etc. Uh, but it starts with the foundation of what the system is supposed to do relative to First Nations health and wellness. So uh, we see cases of untoward death, mm -hmm. uh, unnecessary death when we examine the cases, uh, wondering whether or not enough diagnostics and responses uh, to people uh, with their concerns coming to an eMERGE or to a doctor's office. We have many, many, many cases, and I've been collecting those cases uh, since I was a, a, um, a teacher at the University of Manitoba in the medical school. Right. Well, sticking with s sort of northern, the northern health region here, last month, KIM, KIM excuse me, sent out a, a press release saying KIM and MK were frustrated yeah. with the northern health region and, and what maybe a rise in incidents uh, of mistreatment of First Nations people, I believe, is was sort of the, the gist of that. So what led specifically to that release going out? Well, I mean, we've been working, we are working with the Northern Regional Health and the province of Manitoba uh, fairly closely, uh, looking at transitioning and transforming uh, health care for First Nations people, uh, assuming the Manitoba FINIB office uh, functions and services. Uh, and we're so we need to have the province of Manitoba on board for a trilateral agreement. So we've been speaking with them, working with them, working with the bureaucrats, uh, and the Northern Regional Health specifically um, got uh, uh, you know they advertised for a new CEO, 
uh, for the Northern Regional Health, and we told them at point blank that we want to be involved so that the white bias can be eliminated mm -hmm. as much as possible in uh, you know, defining who would be the CEO in an area that is primarily Indigenous. And so we worked with them, worked with them, and at one point in time, the Northern Regional Health authorities uh, wouldn't share information for us. So we had to apply for fi uh, 14 FIPA requests, meaning that they wouldn't share the information. We found out that a, a, a company in Alberta was uh, screening people uh, for a CEO, and there were no Indigenous people involved. Right. Okay, so given everything that, that we've sort of talked about so far, what maybe is going to lead to a, to a change in, in the positive direction here? Well, we have, uh, we uh, got um, uh, resources, we have uh, monies. After Joyce Eshaquan, um, the federal government gathered a number of us um, uh, two or three times across the nation. Um, and uh, I asked for money to address Indigenous specific racism uh, at Thompson General Hospital or the Northern Regional Health Authority, and they, they gave us uh, money. Okay. And so we've started a program, and I, I, I want to apologize to the Cree speakers out there, Sagi Waywin. So it means love. Uh, so we started a, a, a program, and it commences this week where we have uh, patient advocates who are First Nations and they're being trained in how to support people coming to emerge. So we see the emergency at Thompson General as a, a very real site of violence mm -hmm. uh, against Indigenous people requiring help. And so we've institute, we institute this week uh, a new program that's probably the first of its kind in Canada uh, that is about anti-racism, but it's supporting uh, people who come from communities where in many cases there's already a medical deficit in terms of primary care, especially now that we have a lack of nurses, um, to try and max out their uh, encounter in a positive way. Okay. So somebody coming in with a headache, with a urine infection or a sick baby, um, you don't need to worry anything other than being ill mm -hmm. and seeking care. You don't need to worry about somebody treating you disrespectfully or dismissing anything that you say. And that really, uh, that those racial dismissals are incredibly powerful mm -hmm. and they can kill. Yeah, they certainly can, and yeah. there's been examples of that in the past, right? Yeah. So, um, and one of, one, of, one of the things I wanted to, to also bring up was, um, I believe this month Manitoba is starting to collect race-based data in, in hospitals, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and um, I believe it's the first province to do so. So what do you think of that, and how will that sort of help address what's going on in the healthcare system? Sure, I mean, that's really important. Our colleagues in, in New Zealand have uh, been collecting race-based data for, I think, 15 years mm -hmm. now. And some examples of how it elucidates what's going on in the system that you can't see. So when a person goes into the hospital, say for severe chest infection, they get an x-ray, they, they might see a lung doctor who might write another prescription, and, and you have this whole platform of, of things that are being done to you. It's very difficult to elucidate that in an interview. But the data, we can actually separate data from white people to First Nations people, and we could track people with the same symptoms and presentation and find out where they go. So our Maori colleagues in New Zealand discovered that uh, severe, severe asthmatics uh, and separated the white kids from the uh, Maori kids. And they found through a tracking system that uh, the, uh, uh, the um, lung specialists um, favored white kids and gave them the best medicine oh, wow. compared to Maori kids. So that's really an act of dismissiveness around the symptoms or just blatant hatred or just don't care, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but we also did that, uh, that was done in New Zealand about uh, an indigenous man comes in after a couple of beers, he has chest pain, and the white man comes in with a, a suit um, and having a couple of cocktails, and we can watch who gets the definitive diagnosis, like yeah. with, you know, with the injecting dye and finding out if there's really a blockage. It's the white man who gets it preferentially compared to the Maori man. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the university and Dr. Uh, Marsha Anderson has been working on this file uh, for about 10 years, maybe a little bit more than 10 years. She's not that old anyway. Um, and so that's been her passion, mm -hmm. is to really hold the system accountable 
on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis so that we can actually go into that system and see are you doing right by Indigenous people. And that is very important because that is a report card to the system that is meant to take care of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it sounds like great work there that's going on with, with her and, and everything that mm-hmm. everybody's trying to do. So um, before we, we wrap up, we'll just I'll sort of ask this again, and you maybe touched on it a little bit with the program that, that's going on that you guys have started, but um, what are maybe some, some short-term and long-term plans to, to address what we've talked about so far? I, I think the long-term plan really is emancipation. So really, um, we can take over the Northern Regional Health Authority. Indigenous people can do that. We have enough scholars, we have enough practitioners, we have administrators, uh, we have great leaders. We don't need somebody else running a system for us. Mm-hmm. We're really quite good scientists, okay? Um, but in the short term, we're going to be looking at uh, at supporting uh, actions in the hospital, in the clinics. Uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, again, uh, going back to Indigenous Health 101 uh, for non-Indigenous people, meaning understand our historical context, mm-hmm. understand how the current context of racism, colonization impacts our ability to manifest um, health behavior that you can see and recognize. So really, and you know, one of the really important things to understand is that mental health is not about depression, psychosis, etc. But mental unwellness uh, for Indigenous people is a manifestation of ongoing day-to-day uh, trauma that people experience in such a racist environment as Winnipeg, Manitoba, or Thompson, Manitoba. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well, Dr. Lavalley, there's certainly a lot to think about here and, and a lot to look forward to from the sounds of it with all the work that's being done yeah. in, in northern Manitoba and, and everywhere with all these, um, you know, Indigenous acts and and so it looks like there's a, a lot to look forward to. Like I said, so we really appreciate you coming in. Um, yeah, thank you. So thank you so thank much you for, for your, your insight into this. Yeah. All right, we have to step aside for a moment. When we come back, we'll head online to see what you, the audience, is saying. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Daryl. Online, we ask, in what ways can the health tier system be reformed to better serve the needs of Indigenous peoples and also build trust? Let's take a look at some of your comments. First from Victor. Need more of our community people to start volunteering on the board of directors and on committees of hospitals. Need to get involved in the valuation of the hospital through the accreditation process that they go through every three years or so. Anne said, more training and awareness for healthcare workers. Similar to Native Studies classes being a prerequisite for nursing school and college, more needs to be done to counteract the systemic racism projected through workers that do not understand Canada's history. From Leonard, clearly to serve the needs of Indigenous people, get rid of racism. Tammy said, our own hospitals, our own nurses, move away from pharmaceutical and more into naturopathy. Jenny said, trauma and healing centers locally everywhere. Bring back our teachings, culture, and language. From Christina, incorporate traditional medicines into treatment. Carrie said, take the time to sit and listen. Don't have a time frame such as an hour slotted time to meet and then the appointment is over. First Nations people take time to trust people. If you don't have the time, they will know. Lastly, from Angel, they can start by acknowledging that systemic racism exists. Health ministers order workplace surveys that reveal high degrees of racial and discriminatory attitudes in their workforce, but they fail to accept and adopt the recommendations made by the research companies. Thank you all for sharing. If you want to add your thoughts, here's how. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. 
Well, members of the Siksika Nation in Alberta have been coming forward with complaints of discrimination in the health care system. Here is Tamir Pimentel with how band leaders plan to deal with the situation. Siksika Chief and Council announced it will be collecting stories from people who have experienced racism within the Alberta health care system. A steady flow of complaints have been made to Chief and Council in this area and leadership is working with a team of lawyers on this matter. Chief Ore Crowfoot says the number of complaints have been rising with the pandemic and wants to ensure a safe space for Siksika members or any Indigenous person in the area to come forward. We are constantly being reminded of racist and heartbreaking stories. Stories like Joyce Eshaquan, who live streamed mistreatment she was receiving from Montreal health care workers moments before she died in 2020. Her story is not an isolated incident. Far too long we have been subject to racist and discriminatory behavior while receiving health care. For too long we have been insulted we were, when we were at our most vulnerable. In January, a study from the University of Alberta revealed emergency rooms across the province are treating First Nations patients less urgently than non-Indigenous. Councillor Samuel Crowfoot says many members here choose to avoid local health care facilities because of racist treatment. The complaint process in general in Alberta for any type of medical uh, uh, issue or uh, uh, any type of racist or derogatory event is extremely hard to follow and is governed uh, not in the most efficient way. Thereby, I think it reduces the amount of complaints that come in. CEO of Siksika Health Services, Tyler White, says ultimately the stories will be brought to all levels of governments. Uh, disappointed that we've had to take these types of measures in order to get the attention of our government, um, both federal and provincial. And these aren't just stories, these are real experiences. The complaints will be collected over an unknown period of time, depending on how quickly members come forward. Once ready, the nation will work with JFK Law Corporation to decide the next steps. And on a similar note, a pair of University of Calgary researchers have drilled down into racial bias amongst Alberta physicians. I spoke with Pamela Roach and Shannon Ruzicki earlier. Pamela, Shannon, thank you both so much for joining us here on APTN In Focus. Uh, Pamela, I'll start with you and direct this first question to you. Can you tell us a bit about the survey for our audience that may not have uh, heard about the survey? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we sent out a survey in the fall of 2020, um, so September to October, um, to every practicing physician in the province of Alberta to not only collect some demographic information that we don't really um, do very well, so we wanted to get a sense of that, but we also asked two explicit anti-Indigenous bias questions and one implicit anti-Indigenous bias question. And uh, Shannon, what prompted the survey? Uh, what, like, what made you guys sort of think, hey, let, let's send the survey out? The most important part is that we know from the governmental reports like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as well as the In, Place, In Plain Sight report among others that Indigenous people in Canada experience explicit anti-Indigenous racism in the healthcare system. And we have some information about how that structural bias or systems level bias plays out with, for example, the residential school system and the Indian Act. But what we don't really study very often or talk about very often is the source of these anti-Indigenous biases or the interpersonal anti-Indigenous bias that healthcare providers have. And we see glimpses of it in the news like Joyce Eshaquan's story, but we wanted to really document what is the bias of healthcare providers who create the system, who are part of the system and who treat patients. So then, Shannon, who took part in the survey? Where, where did this survey go out and, and who took part in this? We emailed the survey out through the newsletters of the Alberta Medical Association, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta, and through Alberta Health Services, with the aim to get as many reminders and notices to all practicing physicians in Alberta. We have about 12,000 to 13,000 practicing physicians in Alberta, and we had over 1,000 respondents. Okay, well, that's, that's a pretty decent turnout then, I imagine. And um, Pamela, what, what sort of questions were asked on the survey? I know you touched on the questions, but so what kind of questions were, were on the survey? 
Yeah, um, so in addition to the, the general questions about asking where people practiced, what kind of specialty uh, they were in, um, and, and general demographic questions, we asked two explicit questions about anti-Indigenous bias. And remembering that these surveys came out through employers and regulatory bodies, um, and physicians were still, still comfortable um, expressing their views. So the two explicit bias questions, the first was asking if um, someone felt cold or warm, so unfavorable or favorable towards Indigenous people. And the second was, do they prefer white European people over Indigenous people? And those were both little sliders, we call them thermometer questions, where they had to click on a little bar on their screen and slide it. So there was no trick, they could slide it as, as far to the left or the right as they wanted to, or they could leave it. They could leave it and not actually move it as well. Um, and then we actually did, we included an implicit bias test as well. So that is, some of you may have um, tried that already with different tests. It's a little keyboard-based uh, measure, keyboard-based test that measures your reaction and your response time to different positive or negative words and associated with different faces. Um, and so we actually asked that question as well. So then in, in that case, uh, well, what evidence revealed that racism in, in the Alberta healthcare system exists? Well, for that first question around feeling cold or warm towards Indigenous people, we had about 8% of responding physicians actually indicate that they felt cold towards Indigenous people. The second question about preferring white people or Indigenous people, 25%, so that's a quarter of all the, the practicing physicians in the province who responded to the, that question, actually indicated that they prefer white people. Um, and then out of the implicit bias responses, it was two, just over two thirds, so 67% of physicians actually re completed that, that question in a way that indicated they had uh, an implicit bias against Indigenous people. It, were those numbers surprising at all to either of you or, or, or just sort of all, like did you have any expectations going in? I just that num those numbers I, mean, I just I just I'm just curious uh, for, for both of you your perspective on that. That's a really interesting question and we talk about this a lot because Pam and I have different answers to this. So as a white woman, I did feel surprised that my colleagues, physicians in Alberta would on a survey from their employer indicate that they feel unfavorably or cold towards indigenous people or that they preferred white people and i did feel surprised and pam and i talk about how that really shows my white privilege as not experiencing racism because pam i don't want to speak for you but you weren't surprised right no i was i was not surprised um if anything i feel like the numbers are probably a bit low because of something we call social desirability bias which is just when people answer the question in a way they think is socially acceptable or don't answer the question at all because they don't, they don't want to make, a, a, they don't want to answer something that makes them so uncomfortable. But I think based on all of the stories that we hear from Indigenous patients in the media, the ones that go unreported, all of the experiences that many of us know that ourselves or our family members or our friends have gone through, um, I, I anticipate that this is this number is actually an underrepresentation. Right, that's a good point there. And, and, and so for, I guess, uh, I'll come back to you, Pamela, here. And then what sort of reaction has there been to this survey since it's been out and, and the, the results of the said survey? Uh, largely supportive. Um, definitely Indigenous physicians have been reaching out to me to say that they are uh, pleased that we've done the work and that we're shining more of a light on, on this need. And there's quite an urgent need to, to change the health system. Um, I have had Indigenous community members find me and reach out to me um, because they do, I think, feel that there's someone there who will believe them. Uh, I think generally there's a shift to wanting to make things better, um, but well, I, it's a bit early as far as the system's point of view, and maybe I'll ask Shannon what she feels about that too, but I, I think it'll take a while to, to shift um, some of the accountability structures in the system. From my end, I received a lot of mixed comments, positive and negative, about the study. Um, unfortunately, I do feel that the, that the racism that people have, have learned in Canada or have um, taken in in Canada is so strong that people feel like even talking about racism or saying that anti-Indigenous racism exists is somehow oppressive towards white people or offensive to white people in a way. And so I have gotten emails from people 
um, saying that I'm racist towards white people for participating in this study and doing this study, which is, you know, obviously not true because we're just revealing an inequity and an important source of, of harm and disadvantage for Indigenous people in Canada. Um, some, we have heard a lot of positive or um, people hoping that this inspires change and so that I'm very hopeful that this study helps us really examine our, our attitudes, our beliefs and our colleagues and what we, we accept and don't accept from our healthcare professionals. Well, what you just said is I, I wanted to touch on that topic and, and what, in going into the survey, what were you guys hoping would, would happen as a result and, and maybe are you seeing something happen as a result of the survey and, and maybe what you hoped people would take away maybe? I, I do think we're seeing some of the things that we wanted. So one of my objectives in the study was to bear witness and to document the existence of explicit anti-Indigenous racism among healthcare providers. Because interestingly, uh, when Pam and I had previously spoken to leaders, advocates, other researchers, um, journal editors, people would always say, okay, well, we know that there's implicit biases, we know about system level biases, but there aren't really doctors who are going around saying, oh, I don't like Indigenous people or I won't treat Indigenous people. And, oh, you know, like the, you know, Joyce Eshawan case is a, a one-off, is just bad luck or a bad apple or whatever. And, and, and Pam and I certainly didn't feel that that was reflective of the truth. And so I hoped that this study would speak the language of the healthcare system and that it would be a research study that proved in a way that, that we understand it in medicine, that this is a problem, these biases exist and they're part of that harm that we need to address. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, from my point of view, a lot of the work that I do is also around medical education and how we educate up and coming doctors and also doctors currently practicing. And so what this does is allow us to be able to focus some of that educational work to areas or specialties or you know geographical settings where we can see that there was higher levels of bias. Um, and also sort of continue to garner support for some of the work that's happening. So we know that there's more sort of hands-on anti-racism training happening. So this continues to prove that need because we have physicians who are practicing, who are seeing Indigenous patients, who are willing to put their hand up and say, actually, this is me, I don't like Indigenous people. And the assumption that this wouldn't impact the way they treat someone um, in a clinical setting uh, is, would be completely false, right? We know that this will have impact. So it, it helps further emphasize the importance of the way we educate um, and then the way we hold each other accountable to. Right, absolutely. And and um, last one for, for both the both of you here. Do you do either of you have an idea as to maybe what will happen next in, in regards to the survey and, and the results of the survey? Um, maybe I can speak a little bit. We've been contacted already by people in different provinces or different clinical settings um, who are interested in exploring these similar kinds of questions in their own workplaces, which I think is really important. Um, so we've been trying to, to make sure we have as many of those conversations as possible. Um, and then I think there's some bigger conversations to have with like the Alberta Medical Association and the CPSA around you know what structures do we need in place what policies do we need in place to make sure that that when these things happen um, or when these physicians are are harming patients that we can actually take action and i've been in conversation with leadership through the coming school of medicine at the university of calgary with the college of physicians and surgeons of alberta with alberta health services about how our anti-racism work our anti-oppressive work needs to to better address these issues and how it might need to be restructured and i think a big part of that is is admitting to ourselves that that we are part of the problem and our colleagues are part of the problem because i think it's very easy to look at historical factors and distance ourselves from that because i think it is very uncomfortable to say how have i contributed to the harms that indigenous people have faced in our healthcare system and how has my own implicit and explicit racism contributed to poor outcomes for people. I don't know that a lot of people really want to face that or it's very uncomfortable even to discuss race, racism, colonization, and oppression. And so I think that even having a way to talk about these things and to face these things um, is a really important first step, but it's a first step, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly is, and we're, we'll have to look and see uh, sort of what the next steps are from this. And it's, this is such an important resource now that that the survey is out there. And um, you know, Pamela, Shannon, thank you guys so much. This is such an important talk, and I'm really glad that we were able to get the both of you on and speak about this. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. All right, it's time to pause our show one more time here. We'll speak with our very own Lindsay Richardson when we return. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Before Lindsay joins us, here's a look back at a painful video in Quebec and a Tikamik woman in hospital, and it shows the nurses attending to her being rude and dismissive. The woman died shortly after the video was live on Facebook. Tom Fenario has the details and the warning to viewers of some of the images and language in this story may be disturbing. <sighs> Despite being in obvious distress, Joyce Echaquan took the time to live stream this video. It turned out to be one of her last acts. The Atikamik woman died not long after posting it. In her video, Echaquan captured racist and dismissive behavior by her nurses at a hospital in Joliet, about an hour north of Montreal. The condemnation of the nurse's behavior was swift. The chief and counsel of Echaquan's First Nation is livid. How many victims do there have to be before the Francois Legault government reacts and recognizes that systemic racism exists in Quebec? Quebec native women are urging Premier Legault to act. He must intervene in public services which still discriminate against indigenous peoples in Quebec. So much so, another vulnerable woman obviously lived the last hours of her life being confronted with it. The Commission in Charge of Improving Health Services for First Nations says it's all the more disturbing to see that this form of violence is perpetrated by health professionals who we should be able to trust. Eshaquan was a mother in her mid-30s. In the video, she says in the Atikamik language she is concerned about being given drugs that she is allergic to. This incident comes one year after a provincial inquiry found Indigenous people in Quebec are subjected to significant amounts of racism in the health care system. Quebec Indigenous Affairs Minister Sylvie Damon says an investigation is underway. Well, with more on some of the fallout since this incident, we are joined by Lindsay Richardson. Lindsay, thank you so much for joining us here today on APTN In Focus. Now, we've touched on the incident with Joyce Echaquan a couple of times throughout the show. So my first question for you is, can you just remind our viewers who Joyce is and, and what happened to her? Yeah, Daryl, of course. So it's a very complicated story, obviously, with many overlapping factors. All of this unfurled over several weeks during a coroner's inquest. But to boil it down to the most basic facts, this is what you need to know. Joyce Echaquan was a 37-year-old Atikamek mother of seven with numerous compounded health issues for which she was receiving treatment at the Joliet Health Center about two hours outside of her home community of Manawan. Uh, now, it's an institution that community members are very familiar with. Unfortunately, there is nothing actually closer for them. So Joyce was there uh, complaining of pain, uh, hoping to receive some attention from the healthcare workers that were tending to her that night. Uh, she was labeled belligerent and difficult by the people who were tasked with her care. She was sedated, she was restrained and in extreme pain, and in her dying moments was able to reach for her phone, hit the live button on Facebook, and capture the moment when her caregivers were actually heard hurtling racial slurs towards her, calling her effing stupid, saying that her kind is only good for sex. Really appalling things that in no circumstance <laughs> would have been pertinent to her care or just appropriate in that moment. Back home in Manawan, her husband, Carol Dubay, was notified by neighbors about a Facebook Live video that had gone up. And although in that video, towards the end, we do see the healthcare worker take the phone from Joyce, stop the recording, and later find out that she tried to delete that video, by that point it had already circulated on social media. The community was already abuzz with the news that something had happened to Joyce at Joliet. The circumstances at that time 
were pretty unclear, but the video circulated internationally, inspiring calls for change, for health care reform, and ultimately the repeated message, to which to this day is justice for Joyce. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay, you mentioned the, the Facebook video and, and sort of the repercussions from that. Now, you've covered this story from the start. So how have her videos or, or the video impacted the narrative of racism within the health care system? Well, the coroner who spent several weeks, you know, hearing testimony from all, all sectors, all people who were involved in Joyce's care from the regional health board, she actually infamously concluded that Joyce would likely still be alive today if she were a white woman. And I think across the board from politicians, from community members, everyone agrees that the treatment that she was receiving was inadequate, that the racism that she was sub subjected to was unacceptable. But in the political sphere, this has become kind of a game of words here. The community says that Joyce was a victim of systemic racism, something that imbues all tiers, all sectors of Quebec society and the Quebec government in turn denies the presence of systemic racism. They say they disagree with the definition, they understand systemic racism to be systematic racism and they don't think that our health care system was created with the sole intent of subjecting indigenous people to racism. So this is a back and forth that continues even to this day. Um, it's an agree to disagree situation, but you know, although we haven't seen any other very flagrant examples of racism like what Joyce experienced, it has actually opened up conversation to other sectors uh, and other ways that First Nations and Inuit communities are underserved by the health and social services sector. So that could be in terms of, you know, having things closer to home, having employees that are culturally sensitized, having adequate transportation to and from, quote unquote, remote communities. So that, com that conversation continues while the stalemate over this idea of systemic racism still continues and persists. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lindsay, you had mentioned sort of the, the both sides of the argument, if you will, with the community and, and the government. So you touched on the reaction of that, but uh, maybe I'll ask again about the reaction from the community and the governments and maybe where where they stand on everything sort of going forward. You said it's kind of a, it's sort of like a stalemate, if you will. So what, what's sort of the, the two sides saying? What's been the reaction from both sides as this has sort of unfolded over the last you know number of, of months? Well, the community mobilized very quickly and even days after Joyce's death held a large-scale demonstration and vigil outside of the Joliet Hospital. So that was the first sort of push for community action. And after that, they undertook uh, quite a lengthy consultation process with other Atikamek communities, with First Nations stakeholders in general, to kind of take, to back up and take a macro look at the healthcare system, to talk about the concerns, to talk about the historic issues there, the lack of goodwill. And and also how the pandemic has sort of compounded the resources that are available, how it has in fact strained the healthcare system to a very severe degree. So all of these ideas, these uh, suggestions have come together in the document that they've called Joyce's Principle. And Joyce's Principle was acknowledged by the House of Commons, it's been acknowledged by the United Nations. Almost everybody except the Quebec government has really given the stamp of approval and said that this is a viable plan for health care reform. Form. Quebec, like I mentioned, will not adopt it in its entirety because it calls for recognition of the contributions to systemic racism, which they don't feel exists. So essentially, Quebec took that document, said thank you for the ideas and thank you for the work and the consultation that you've done, but we're going to do our own thing with this. And so that's what we are currently waiting for right now, is to see whether or not Indigenous peoples are going to be protected in a healthcare context through better laws, better policies, more funding. So unfortunately it's a long-winded process and we're inching closer to progress but there's no clear <laughs> idea on the horizon for when this will be resolved completely. Right and, and you, you've certainly given us a lot of information so far but I guess I'll sort of um, ask what the latest is. Uh, some of what you just said it sounds like was sort of a wait-and-see game so, so what is the latest here with um, Joyce's story? 
Okay, so well, community members and Quebec Native women were actually just recently at the National Assembly to push again for adoption of Joyce's principle, recognition of systemic racism. But the Quebec government insists that this recognition is not preventing them from taking action in other ways. And to their credit, they have taken some steps to correct or amend this issue. They've made space for more Indigenous representation on the regional health boards. They funded uh, the opening of an Indigenous health care clinic operating in Joliet, which is supposed to open doors in 2025. And they've also implemented mandatory cultural sensitivity training for all public health care sector employees. The thing is, I've spoken to some health care employees who did not want to go on the record who explained to me that they are in fact facing pressure from management to sort of speed through the training, you know, maybe not take it as seriously as it's intended to be taken. And uh, we've been unable to get confirmation from the health ministry to find out how many health care workers at this point have completed this mandatory training. And if they haven't, what kind of punitive measures or sanctions they might be exposed to. So that's still a bit of a question. Quebec, after the pandemic, also introduced some amendments to their health and social services law. The community was hoping to see the right to cultural security really enshrined in that piece of legislation and were disappointed when it was not included. But our Indigenous Affairs Minister is promising that that will be subject of its own law uh, that is supposed to be upcoming. We spoke to Joyce's widower actually a few weeks ago and he said he heard some murmurings that there might be a presentation made in June. We've been unable to confirm that information. But meanwhile, he's undertaking his own steps towards healing. He just undertook a 3,500 kilometer skidoo journey uh, with an ensemble of First Nations communities to really raise awareness of this issue of systemic racism and to try to get you know, the ensemble of Quebec society on board to push the government for this recognition of systemic racism. And it's not a fight they're planning on giving up anytime soon. Well, it's uh, certainly a lot to think about and a lot to uh, look forward to, Lindsay. And, and just before we let you go, I wanted to ask, um, the, like I had mentioned, you, you've been on this story right, right from the beginning. And one of your stories, it actually had the uh, home videos of Joyce Eshaquan. And I just wanted to ask, um, one of the questions I'd asked previously was who Joyce Eshaquan is. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on those home videos and maybe um, for our audience, what those videos meant. I, I remember going through those videos and, and getting quite emotional, to be honest with you. Joyce was a, a doting mother. She was extremely close to her children. She was a new grandmother at the time of her death. Uh, and very much a do-it-yourself documentarian. There were no moments in her life that she didn't feel were worth documenting. So her Facebook page is just rich with these images of her laughing with her children or you know, eating food at a mall or um, you know, just being in love and alive with her husband. And you know, she was a woman who could have had a lot of years to go and uh, you know, whose absence is very much felt. But for her children, for, you know, Carole, her widower, I think those videos are a lasting testament to what an incredible person she was. And, and not the person that we heard about during testimony, during the coroner's inquest. Uh, she was labeled as, you know, narco-dependent because she used prescription pills that <laughs> she was given by doctors f during other visits, you know, labeled as difficult as a frequent flyer in the hospital system. So I think those videos are very important to sort of ground us in reality and, and remind us that there's very much a human attached to these principles and policies that we're fighting so hard for mm -hmm. at the highest levels of government. Yeah, it's really well said, Lindsay, and we, uh, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you again so much for coming on. I know you and the team in Montreal is always hard at work on, on such great stories and, and great things. So, um, again, thank you, Lindsay, for coming on and, and uh, sharing a bit of info with us. Always a pleasure, Daryl. Thanks for having me. Well, as mentioned in the interview with Lindsay, here's a look at the profile that she put together. If a picture's worth a thousand words, what about video? Joyce Eshaquan filmed everything. The important things. Memories to be cherished forever. Others, not so much. An 18th birthday. 
Her family. And her husband, Carol, <laughs> who always made her laugh. <laughs> The Eshaquan family's lawyer granted APTN exclusive access to these videos to remind the public of Joyce's life before her live video taken last September 28th, before everything changed. <laughs> Merci pour votre courage. Merci pour votre résilience, votre force. The coroner's inquest examining Joyce's death officially ended just over a week ago. Experts went on record saying it was preventable, that Joyce was a casualty of the flawed environment at Joliet Hospital. The video in which she live streamed her last moments drew international outrage. But in court testimony, she was labeled narcotic dependent, an aggressive woman in poor health who struggled with mental illness. This is not the woman her family knew. All right, that's all we have for you on this April 19th edition of APTN in Focus. Today's episode will be available as a podcast. You can listen and subscribe on aptnnews.ca slash podcasts, or you can find us on your favorite player. And if you missed any of our past episodes and you want to catch up, you can find them and more on aptnnews.ca. Thank you again so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.